Howdy, folks. Welcome back to another special edition of the Texas Signal Signal Cast. I'm your host, Joe Desotel, and I'm here with my friend, David Leffler. How are you doing, David? Joe, I'm doing great today, man. Excited to talk. Good, good. Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of times we do these wrap-ups, and it's usually always such bad news, but we actually had a couple things that were, uh, going on that are some good signs of things to come here in Texas. One of those things we're going to talk about is the big rally uh, for voter voting rights that took place at the Capitol, the South Steps with Beto and a whole host of progressive leaders from across the state. You were there. I was there. We didn't actually see each other, ironically. That's, <laughs> that's just how big the crowd was, right? Um, but, you know, we also want to talk about some other political posturing that's been going on with our governor, who also has a primary, and it seems to be everything we hear from him on a daily basis is a clear sort of red meat play for his base voters and it's really just getting worse and worse and there's and it's not benign there's actually a lot of people who are suffering because some some of these decisions he's made but let's start with beto and you actually got to speak with beto um you get get to do your own interview with him uh what was sort of you know, he's been running around the state. He had uh, 23 different locations around the whole state that he was going to. Do you know where he is sort of in that track where this rally falls on that tour? And sort of what was it like talking to him in terms of his energy and and where he is sort of mentally with, with this whole thing he's, he's working on? Yeah, yeah. So um, Beto's rally was yesterday. Um, on, on Sunday evening at the uh, south steps of the Texas State Capitol. Um, but he and I got a chance to sit down one-on-one -on -one earlier in the day, kind of before everything kicked off. And, you know, it's funny, you know, you're sitting and talking with him and he's wearing his, you know, his typical blue button down and he's referencing all of these various East Texas towns that he's traveled to and held rallies at. And you kind of step back and you're like, what year am I in? Is this 2018 again? Um, but, you know, it, it definitely speaks to how, you know, and this is nothing new, just how kind of tireless Beto is whenever he kind of sinks his teeth into something and he's running with it. Um, and you would think, you know, after 23 stops, and not just that, but 23 stops after, you know, kind of being out of it for a little bit after last year's, um, you know, situation with the pandemic, really limiting in-person appearances, but um, he seemed very energized, um, definitely very on message when he was talking about not just SB7, but the history of voter suppression in Texas and, and how that, all of that aligns with the express purpose of the rally, which was to help push forward and raise attention about the For the People Act, um, which is going to be getting a read in the U.S. Senate uh, tomorrow. And obviously that is a hotly contested issue. It's been, you know, something at the top of everyone's mind. I think we're all tired of hearing the name Joe Manchin. Um, and the word filibuster, but yeah, he and I got a chance to sit down and talk about um, a myriad of, of issues um, ranging from voting rights in Texas and America as a whole, and also just where he's at uh, mentally with all of this. And of course, we had to touch on um, his potential gubernatorial run as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people are waiting to hear, you know, what he's deciding to do. I don't know if other candidates are out there making that decision based on his, but I know certainly a lot of organizers and voters and people who are watching all this posturing happen on the right and then the Republican primary certainly want to know that we're going to have a strong candidate. And whether it's Beto or not, certainly someone who is willing to do the work that Beto's done and blaze another trail similar to the one that he has going all around the state to small towns in East Texas and North Texas and West Texas and South Texas. We've got a lot of work to do as far as that's concerned. I know he leaned heavily into the Democratic Party's new program to register voters. And that was kind of one of the last things he said at the rally was, I'm really calling on you and asking you to participate, go back out in your community, register voters, and then make sure those folks turn out. And so I know that that is really going to be a refrain we're going to hear over and over again for the next year or so. And it's absolutely one that we need to pay close attention to. And I know in your conversation with him, and we may have a, a clip of this part of the conversation, but you asked him about the state of democracy in Texas. And what, what did he have to say about that? Yeah, yeah. So that was really the core kind of uh, topic that we talked about in all of this is like so much in politics in recent years, there's this great promise, right? Like the For the People Act, would among other things, um, you know, it, at least in its version that passed the U.S. House would make 
uh, you know, election day and national holiday. It would, it would eliminate partisan gerrymandering. It would, um, it would, it would make same day voter registration a reality. It would make automatic voter registration a reality. Um, you know, it would just, it would limit corporate spending. It, ha- it has a lot of, 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 of facets to it that would, in many ways, you know, almost be like a magic wand that would wipe away all of the ongoing and, and historical voter suppression efforts in places like Texas, especially. Um, so we really talked about, you know, that promise while also the reality that, A, again, the Senate has not shown any movement thus far being able to pass that version, especially with the filibuster still intact. And B, um, until that day comes, the fact that the Texas legislature is, again, just seeking to further entrench a lot of its tactics with with bills like SB7. Um, So, yeah, he had a really good, interesting answer on the topic. So we should play the clip. Yeah. Oh, that's me. My bad. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah. sorry. (laughs) Sorry, everyone. No worries. That's exactly what's happening here. You have a system already in place in Texas after the 2013 Shelby decision Mm -hmm. that uh, closed down 750 polling places, mostly in black and brown neighborhoods that imposed the the worst voter ID uh, regime in the the country um, that uh, gerrymandered congressional districts based on race unconstitutionally and illegally. Um, and then everything you saw in 2020, one ballot drop off location per county, including yeah. in Harris County. Yeah. Um, on top of that is, is all of this. We, we, we were already begging the question uh, as to how much of a democracy we, we actually are in Texas. And, and now you would essentially descend into another form of government altogether, um, both with that provision to overturn future elections. And then what you just saw yesterday where you have the governor mm-hmm. vetoing the budget of a co-equal branch of, of government. Yeah. That, yeah. That's tyrannical, uh, that's dictatorial. It is not small d democratic. Um, it, it's, it's not a, a representative form of government anymore when, when one person tries to exercise that much power. So, Yeah, so um, we'll get on the, uh, the topic of, of Greg Abbott's latest actions regarding um, defunding a myriad of different things, including the Texas state legislature. But yeah, I think something that he was really trying to hammer home there is again, the urgency to organize, the urgency to to, to really put as much pressure on politicians as we can. And in that sense, you know, I I don't know about you, but being there in person yesterday, um, it was emotional. It was the first time, you know, being at that, you know, level of a rally and and, and hearing some familiar voices bringing people together and delivering a message I think that we all need to hear right now. And obviously what he's talking about in that clip is, 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 is definitely the more ominous side uh, of things, but it's, you know, we need to be able to have that recognition before we can then take those proactive steps um, that we need to do so. Yeah. And the theme seemed to be from the rally. There were a lot of other speakers besides Beto and a lot Mm -hmm. of them were house members who were part of the quorum break that of course led to the you know, killing of SB7. And so, you know, the the theme broadly was that we need Federal Voting Rights Act. Uh, we need federal voting rights protections. The House members basically did what they could do. And Beto even framed it very well. I think he said the legislators bought us time, but the question is now, what do we do with it? And I think that is a really great framing for the next steps and why Joe Manchin is so important in this whole you know, uh, this whole picture and why Democrats just got back from D.C. meeting with Kamala Harris, the vice president, and and, and really this kind of sense of urgency has risen to the White House. And and it's a really good thing that it has. And I hope, of course, as you say, there's a, there's a vote coming up. But I, I heard today that they, it was basically Jen, uh, Jen Psaki, the, the president's spokesperson, who said that even if this vote fails, we're immediately going to go back to the drawing board and we're going to get something done. And I think that's incredibly important that they focus on that. And I think this type of pressure that happens from these rallies really uh, puts emphasis on that. And so I think it's important. We kind of hear some of the other folks and what they said, Um, you know, TMF was there calling for, of course, for federal voting rights, which is what he did at the original press conference the night that they walked out. 
uh, freshman representative Jasmine Crockett, who makes a regular appearance in the Texas Signal because she's been very open about talking to us. And she's one of the she is a freshman, but she's also a young member. And so she kind of, I think, has a very good grasp on the communication side of things from social media to just being a great communicator with a new audience that we really need to tap into. So I really appreciate the fact that she was there. Uh, she spoke on it and basically said, you know, I'm a freshman. It was a pandemic. This is my first session. I thought for sure we would be focused on healthcare. And then El Paso just happened. I thought for sure we would focus on smart gun policy. And of course, neither one of those things were done. And, you know, she said, essentially, the uh, only thing we had the numbers to do was walk out. And I think that's what, um, you know, that that's what this kind of came down to. And, you know, it's somewhat of a, a, a rightful transition to the things, the other things that the governor has done. And what we've watched him do and position himself over the last few weeks has been pretty awful. Uh, I think he appreciates the national attention he's getting and and he's he's clearly trying to fend off uh, challenges from the right. We know that he has one challenger in Don Huffines, who is a former state senator, and his family basically owns a bunch of car dealerships in North Texas, which is why a lot of people might recognize the Huffines name. So he is a very right wing. And a lot of these ideas that Greg Abbott has sort of come up with recently are ones that have been initially floated by Don Huffines. And he's essentially just trying to steal the wind from his sails so that uh, he can't do a proper challenge. And then today we see that Sid Miller, who we thought might be challenging Governor Abbott because he's been being very vocal and attacking him, floating that trial balloon out there. It, it seemed to burst because he is now announcing that he is running for re-election. And so sort of the final big name that's out there that could potentially challenge Governor Abbott in the Republican primary is Alan West, who is, of course, the chairman of the GOP state party. And he is basically already announced that he's retiring and that he's essentially queued up that he's going to run for something. And everybody is pretty certain that that something is going to be governor of Texas. And so, you know, we, we shall see uh, what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> talk about a uh, short but eventful stint that Alan West had as the Texas GOP chairman, right? I mean, was not in but for a few years. And obviously him resigning and, and, and potentially gearing up for a gubernatorial run is a surprise to no one who's been paying attention. But when you step back and you just really think about how much that guy's star has, has risen in Texas, I mean, one, it's astounding. I mean, there's nothing, there's no other way to put it. But also in the second sense, it just really speaks to, and this is nothing new, but Texas just being the ultimate laboratory for um, right wing kind of extreme politics where you have a guy who's in Florida as a congressman loses and then shows up here and, and is able to immediately take a stranglehold on the party and yeah. has Abbott running scared. I mean, it, yeah. it's, and he's a Trump acolyte and he, you know, is following in that sort of MAGA template and, you know, basically saying everything Republicans do just isn't good enough. It's not extreme enough. It's not right wing enough. It's not conservative enough. And so that's kind of how he's attacked Abbott. And yeah, he's, he's a Florida, he's Florida man coming to Texas to do his thing, but it really highlights how weak the Republican party is. They had this sort of, you know, good old boy system in place where everybody, you know, there's a line of succession they kind of more or less agree. And, and then here comes Alan West and kind of with the sort of Trump momentum in this new party, and shakes up that whole thing as very reminiscent of 2010 when the Tea Party came in and sort of upended the current Republican establishment. And this is something that apparently just happens in the Republican Party every, you know, so many years that they, the current crop get a little too comfortable with where they are. They lose a little bit of touch with, with the extremeness of the base. And of course, we've seen with social media and the disinformation campaigns have produced even more extreme policy initiatives out of Republicans. And these guys have run with that banner and basically are saying, look, you establishment Republicans in Texas, you've been here the last 10 years. You haven't done anything on these issues. And so therefore we need to throw the bums out, uh, which we can agree with them on. Um, but, you know, the thing is um, we're seeing these challenges come on the Republican side. And the irony is 
that they're going to end up getting rid of Ken Paxson before we do, right? Uh, it looks, you know, we kind of mentioned that, you know, he's got a new candidate that is challenging him, a current uh, Texas Supreme Court justice, uh, Ana Guzman. Um, or is it Eva? Eva, Guzman. Eva, yeah. Eva Guzman. So she, uh, you know, is challenging him. And then, of course, George Bush is challenging him. And so if they all get in the same primary, we're going to get rid of a lot of these folks just that way through the primary. And then, of course, there's going to be a new crop. But the, but the hope is that they don't have the, you know, the staying power or the name ID or, or anything. And then we could hopefully uh, challenge and pick up some of these seats. But but yeah, so I did want to talk a little bit about some of the other things that Abbott has done. You know, I think chiefly in this came up with Beto, I think about defunding the legislature. Essentially, there's been a lot of talk about that and it hasn't all been super accurate on what he did. Basically, the framing has been, and this has been Abbott's framing as these guys didn't show up to work, they shouldn't get paid. But also nobody shows up to work if you don't pay them. And so what incentive do they have to come back and do your bidding if you defunded them, let alone whether it's even constitutional or ethical to defund in another branch, co-equal branch of government. Uh, but I just want to set the record straight that he did not defund or take away the salary of legislators. That's actually a constitutional issue. The legislator salaries are in the Constitution, not the budget. What the governor did was he vetoed Article 10 of the budget, which means staff doesn't get paid, which means the LBB doesn't get paid. And some of the other agencies that, you know, are also in Title 10 or Article 10, who had nothing to do with Democrats walking out. And as a matter of fact, the legislator staff includes all the Republicans staff who were also caught up in this. So. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think it's <clears throat> I think it's a uh, section 24 of the uh, Texas Constitution yeah, that guarantees state legislators 600 bucks a month. Um, and, and as you mentioned, right, I mean, this is like anything else, right? It's, it, it just shows that um, when it comes to Abbott, when it comes to, to, to Texas Republicans writ large, um, they're one willing to, 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 to hurt their own if it means securing their political power and obviously be hurting the um, average person if it means scoring those political points, right? Because no one benefits from, from this defunding of the Texas legislature. It may, again, it, it makes for a good headline for Abbott in his eyes. It shows this strength. Again, it's this idea that he's constantly beating back this gubernatorial challenge that hasn't even manifested itself yet, but he's always looking over his shoulder. But, you know, the casualties are left all around him in terms of what this actually means for our our state's ability to make good laws and to represent the people. Yeah, and we always focus on narratives because it's so important. And there's their narrative that Democrats walked off and therefore legislators shouldn't get paid because they're not doing their job, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the fact is the governor is elected to lead the state. He was given 140 days by the voters of Texas to get our priorities taken care of and he wasn't able to do it. And so that's just the lack of leadership. If they can't get priorities taken care of in the time allotted, that's constitutional, then that's his failure. So if he has to call us back for a special session, that just highlights each one of those bills highlights something that he wasn't able to get done in, the, in an appropriate time with total control of the government. And so that's absolutely inefficient and a poor use of, of everyone's time. And really a, just a huge waste of taxpayer dollars. And if you look at some of his other moves, it's not the only waste of taxpayer dollars, obviously, he's he's doing. He is defunding the TDCJ, which is Texas Department of Criminal Justice, $250 million to start this border wall, which is obviously a political play. And it's unclear if he even has authority to do that, right? Yeah. It's an international border. And so even still, that $250 million, which he is taken, by the way, from a public safety agency, is only 1% of the funding of the, of the estimated total cost of a border wall. So, yeah, 20, I mean, well, I'll, 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 Ian, when you talk, when you talk about uh, the fact that the rest of it, you know, or at least a large portion of it, they're claiming they're going to raise via GoFundMe, which is it, you know, we've all gotten used to in our society seeing people have to go fund me things for, for someone being ill, which is an entire different conversation about our society's failings to help those in need. But when you have the government 
who's trying to, to do, who's, who's at least openly discussing using GoFundMe to raise money for a wall that does not work, which also falls in line with, if I'm not mistaken, didn't Steve Bannon and his associates fall under some legal issues for, for crowdfunding for the border wall. So, I mean, yeah. I just, it, 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 even for political stunts, it just seems like the most ridiculous of sideshows. Yeah. And it's clearly vapid, but I'll tell you, it's a great way to get a bunch of email addresses. If you say, I don't know want to run for president and you have all of a sudden now, you know, small donations coming in from all over the country. Mm -hmm. And he even said all over the world, the people who would want to build a wall (laughs) in in Texas on the border. Um, And so we should warn him that taking international money for political campaigns is illegal. Something that, you know, they, they should probably think about. I don't know, but, um, but yeah, you know, go ahead. And no, and something I know that that you were talking about not using, um, the 140 days they're allotted to, to take care of business. I know that, you know, th- there were a number of line item vetoes that he also um, doled out that have had and will have serious ramifications for Texans. Yeah, and specifically for public safety. And so he defunded a, a, a public safety grant for Greater Houston area, which was for crime prevention. He vetoed that himself. It was obviously approved by the legislature in the budget. And that is gone. Um, and then, you know, there's a couple other things that he did, which just, I don't think makes a lot of sense. The, he vetoed an educational requirement that students basically be taught, uh, about preventing child abuse, domestic abuse. Um, and his only reason for that was that there was no parental opt out. So in case you're one of those parents who don't want your child to know about, you know, child safety or how to prevent domestic abuse and, and spousal abuse and things like that. Um, and, and, and that, and that, and, and, and that passed the Senate by a vote of 29 to two. Right? Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, it just reminds me of this video I saw shared recently where it was the police and there were, it was body cam footage and it was a police involved shooting. It was a domestic violence issue. A husband was basically holding his wife hostage. She must've called the police when the police started coming in. He said, I'm going to shoot her. If you come in here, Uh, they actually did shoot at the police. Um, But they, they're doing nothing to prevent, uh, you know, these types of issues from happening, which only makes policing harder makes our public safety officials and law enforcement officers job much harder. They've said as much, they've opposed bills to allow certain people to have access to weapons who, who do this and have records like this. Um, you know, they've opposed the permitless carry bill that would make it harder for them to determine who the real, uh, you know, perpetrator is in a certain, in certain events. And they still managed to get away with saying that they back the blue when even, line item vetoing public safety funding is pretty outrageous and line item vetoing um, understanding and providing instructions and materials and adapt policies relating to the prevention of child abuse, family violence, and dating violence. So, you know, it's, and as you, and as you and I were talking about before, because this is a line item veto, because this is coming at the end of the session, you know, the, the 29 to two vote that happened there, you know, those legislators don't even get another crack at this, right? We're looking at at least another two more years before something as sensible and, and, and as, as prone to public safety as educating kids about violence, not just in their homes, but essentially, you know, these, these could be, you know, seventh and eighth graders early on about what, about what that looks like in a relationship. Now, you know, again, at least two more years before we get another crack at that. And speaking of, um, I know that you had mentioned this to me uh, prior, but um, Senate Bill 474. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the Safe Outdoor Dogs Act basically would have prevented people from tying their dogs and chaining their dogs up to fences and trees during inclement weather. I mean, this is this is a bill that folks have been in advocates for animal safety and anti-cruelty have been trying to pass for multiple sessions, finally got it passed, and then the governor vetoed it. So like, how do you not like dogs? Like, how do you how do you veto something so common sense? He calls it micromanaging, right? And so you see this through line of allowing what freedom means to them is essentially the ability to intimidate other people, you know, abuse, cruelty, violence, whatever, 
um, to other, you know, to other people, they, that's their idea of freedom. I mean, he's, he called it micromanaging and, and no, it's just animal cruelty and we should prevent that kind of thing from happening. And clearly this is not a liberal, a liberal idea. Republicans like their dogs too. And that's why this bill passed. And so he, he wouldn't be able to veto it if it was just a, a, a liberal Democrat bill or something like that. And you have to step back and wonder, I understand that there's this constant facade of, you know, this very surface level idea of what freedom is in the governor's eyes. But you have to wonder who benefits from this. You know, I, I doubt there's a there's, there's not a big lobby who, who's hitting them yeah. up to make sure this doesn't happen. This this again, there's no obviously no winning for Texans. But I have to wonder what the real motivation is on his end, other than, again, maintaining this kind of blanket facade of what freedom is until he says it's not when it comes to women's health and, and everything else like that. Yeah, it's really unclear. Yeah. Who, who's like the big dog cruelty lobby? You know, like who, who's out there like writing checks to make sure that they can you can abuse dogs and tie them up up for days on a chain. Uh, unclear who 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 that audience really is. But <laughs> um, but for, for the rest of these, we can pretty much tell who the audience is and it's his base voters. And you brought up running out of time and his ability uh, to veto things without, uh, you know, an override. You know, the, the interesting thing about the $250 million for the border wall was that if this is, you have to ask, why is this all of a sudden a big issue when during the legislative session or at the beginning, he could have put on the call right then as an emergency item. We want to make sure that, you know, the legislature puts in money in the budget for a wall. Now, he didn't do that. You have to ask yourself why, maybe because it, it's not something he intends to do and it's just a political stunt. That's probably the most obvious um otherwise yeah he would have made this a priority right it wasn't a priority until you know he he had this brilliant idea or at least he took it from don huffines that's right that's right um and and, and again you know he, he, again it's clearly just this idea of having to constantly maintain the the quote-unquote positive headlines on his end and just probably really just trying to get through to this special session um to where they can hope you know on their end hopefully pass through sb7 but um, again, I think this also underscores the fact that when you can, when you are defunding the Texas state legislature, I understand there were some stories written about, um, this, this child abuse law being vetoed. And there were some stories written about the, the, the dog veto, but when you're having these other larger flashy things like defunding the legislature happen, you can afford to slip these things in, you mm -hmm. know, largely unnoticed, you know, because yeah. it, 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 it seems like an onion article at times. Yeah. It's personal. It's petty. But that, that's his brand. And so I, I expect him to continue to do really awful things like that until until he's out of office because it's speculating that it's speculated that he's interested in running for president in 2024. And to your point about the headlines, he's got to get out ahead of DeSantis because he, DeSantis is essentially crushing him in terms of excitement in the grassroots nationally. And so I think he's upset about that. And the only thing only he has power over uh, are people in Texas. And so he's taken it out on the people of Texas, including those in his own party. And so certainly, and, and speaking of what is the latest that you have heard about an upcoming special session? Right? Yeah. So what we think now the rumors has have been for the last few weeks that it looks like right after July 4th holiday that they'll probably call them back. So we're probably expecting a mid July special session. And we believe that the SB7 will be on that call as well as the funding of the legislature, right? So because he, he line item vetoed their funding and the funding of all those agencies under Article 10, he will have to put on the call the opportunity to fund those again. So legislators will have to come back and basically fund the legislature. But the interesting thing in the, in the relationship dynamic is that they don't have to do anything that they don't want to do. And so they can say, go to hell, Greg Abbott. We're going to, we're going to fund our, our staff and these agencies that you defunded, but we're not going to pass your stupid voter suppression bill. Or we're not going to pass any other thing that you put on the call because somebody needs to put him in check. And I think that there are certain elements in the Republican party that understood that they needed to put him in check. And, you know, one of the other, I don't know if it's going to be, we know they're going to be multiple specials because he's basically said as much the, we don't know when the redistricting one's going to be. We expect it to be later on in the fall. 
But the timing issue with the funding of Article 10 is that the new biennium starts September 1st. And so whatever action the legislators do, they're going to have to do it before September 1st in order to not stop payments for people's pay, thousands of people's paychecks. Yeah. And so that is kind of his way of saying, putting a gun to their head and counting the 10, right? Do what I want you to do or you're, you know, I, I he already pulled the trigger, but here it comes, <laughs> here it comes in slow motion, right? Like, uh, you know, you get out of the way um, or you're going to get hit with this. And so that's kind of where we are. Um, I, I, I do expect mid-July that we'll see the voter suppression bill and uh, the funding bill put up on the call. And, you know, that's what's, that's what, you know, it makes this kind of become so circular is when we get to that point, and now I'm not holding my breath for the U.S. Senate, but when we get to that special session, session and they're taking up SB7, when we get to redistricting a few months after that, and they're taking up um, potentially trying to draw under gerrymandered lines, what those, you know, possibilities will look like if, you know, it's a big if a amended version of the For the People Act is able to, in some capacity, pass through the Senate, whether that um, is, is Manchin breaking the filibuster, which obviously he said he will not do, um, or he somehow magically conjures up the 10 Republicans that he claims that he can, he can wrangle. Because even in his limited, very limited version of the For the People Act, it still limits, um, it gets rid of um, partisan gerrymandering specifically, which would obviously have a huge impact on all of this. Now, it wouldn't get rid of some of the obstacles that are already been set in place in places like Texas, um, but that would be a huge start. And it also takes us full circle again to, to the conversation with Beto, right, in terms of what does this mean about the future of Texas? When you think about having someone at the helm here of, of the governorship and just who's really just willing to do anything and everything to not just control the narrative, but to, to try to put those in place, even within his own party, who do anything that is slightly askew from what he wants. Um, you know, I, I had a chance to ask Beto about that. And I didn't want to ask him, hey, straight up, are you running for governor? I know he's tired of that. But I just asked him, you know, kind of where he sits with all of this as he's traveled around the state. Um, and he kind of touched on, you know, the sentiment that we've heard from, from him a lot lately, which is that until we fix this system, and I have to finish this fight. And because until we fix the system, you know, it doesn't matter who we're trotting out there. It doesn't matter who's running. If, if the suppression that we're already seeing now is not only in place, but is going to be ramped up that much more. And, he, and, you know, and he feels, it's clear that he feels very torn. You know, he, I asked him if there were any kind of anecdotes that stood out to him most um, from being on, on the trail. And he mentioned a woman named Rena uh, that he spoke to in Carthage um, in East Texas. And he was saying how she didn't come out to see him out of pure enthusiasm for democracy or because she was fired up. She just came out to him and said, hey, I know you used to be in Congress and that you used to have some power my daughter, um, you know, has a severe disability and, and we're on a 20 year wait list to access state supported services, 20 wow. years. Wow. Um, and, 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 you know, can you do anything to help me? And, you know, he's, he's talked a lot about how he has uh, a family member with a disability and he, and he mentioned how, you know, he's used to navigating this process. He knows the frustration and all he could tell her then was, you know, the most we can do right now is to try to get in touch with your Congress member and try to help. And so, you know, I don't know how, if you're, if you're him and you're hearing those conversations, that doesn't just, you know, give you an insatiable, like, desire, you know, this unscratchable itch to make you want to run. He, he, I understand he, he's holding back now, but, um, you know, that's only one of countless conversations he's had to have had about people being disenfranchised. So, of course, you know, you have to get the system fixed first and foremost, and that's a big if, and it's, it's a huge need. But you'd have to imagine that as soon as, that is in place in whatever capacity they can manage, it's going to be turnkey from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he'll have a lot of help if, if he chooses to do that, because we saw a, at the rally, there's a lot of folks who are fired up and they're from all over the state and they're organizing in their various neighborhoods and communities, but you always need a leader and you need somebody out there who is going to sort of set the tone and the pace for things. And it could be him. And, you know, I think we'll know, relatively soon um it's just hard and and i think that if they were to pass the the nonpartisan redistricting bill at the federal level man that would benefit texas 
so much. I know the pre-clearance issue was in there. And I think that's essentially what they're, what you might be referring to. Pre-clearance was something that uh, Texas had up until I think 2003-ish. And I think that's what he was referring to the Shelby case. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, states that have a history of racial segregation and, and, and gerrymandering and suppression had to go under pre-clearance for the federal government on their, uh, their lines uh, when they redrew district lines. And we need that desperately in Texas because our, our maps are consistently in the courts because we're suing over them and the courts have consistently found that there has been racial gerrymandering. And I remember at one point, I'll never forget, it was something to the effect of, I may not repeat it verbatim, but essentially what Abbott said what, when they asked him about this, were, are, are you racial, racially gerrymandering? And he says, no, we're not, we're not targeting African-Americans and Latinos. We're targeting Democrats. They just happen to be African-Americans and Latinos. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, okay. So, you know, uh, that's how they get around this stuff. And we've seen, you know, so much of it uh, with even the way they've reacted to Juneteenth being uh, now a federal holiday. We've seen, we've seen some of the way that they're trying to somehow connect this to critical race theory and some of the idiotic things that they've said and done, which directly translate to these efforts to at voter suppression that we've seen, because there's essentially a through line from the fact that it took people in Texas almost three years, over two years to find out that they were even free uh, after they lost the fight with the federal government. Hell, after they lost the fight with Mexico, right? This was the governor's idea to create this 1836 project, which was to tell a different story about Texas history when we know that Texas was fighting Mexico because Mexico had outlawed slavery. Texas fought them. They got their independence. They kept slavery. And then we fought another war <laughs> over it. And when they lost that, that war, and they still didn't want to give up the slaves. It took another two years before, guess who what? The federal government came in and said, you got to do it. And then they, they finally did it. Um, and, and, and that's why we have that, that new federal holiday, Juneteenth. But it's all connected. They don't want to teach the history. They don't want you to know because if you did learn the history, you would be able to make a direct connection to what's happening today. And... You know, to a lot of people, I don't think people realize that um, the 13th Amendment that freed the slaves did so only for uh, for people that were not incarcerated. And so we still see today in our prison system, we can see the disparities in who's actually imprisoned and who gets sentencing. And we can see that a lot of those people are still doing forced labor. And so there's a lot of issues um, that are sort of connect to this in a broader way. But the Democrats have got to find a way to articulate uh, what's happening and connect it in people's minds to their own experience and what they know and believe about um, what's going on in our country. So a lot to do on our part. But Always, uh, always. And, and, and to the love of God, like whatever it takes, I just don't want to see any more videos of Ted Cruz pledging allegiance to the flag. Like that's, uh, that's... <laughs> uh, man, yeah, that guy. Um, yeah, what an embarrassment. Um, yeah, it would have been nice to have a, a Senator Beto uh, as opposed to Ted Cruz because he continues to be a laughing stock for the, for the entire country. Um, but we'll continue to follow this as things unfold. And I'm, I'm, I'm certain that once we hear an announcement from the governor on a date, that we'll be right back here, me and you, to discuss the implications of a midsummer special to just do voter suppression. And we'll continue to get that national attention on our folks and, and build name ID, brand recognition, and really show that Democrats are fighting for the people of Texas and their right to vote. And so uh, that's the good news in all this, is that there are people that are fighting really hard, like Beto, but you may not know who they are, but they're in Dallas, they're in Houston, they're in Austin, they're in East Texas and South Texas. They're at the local level. They're on city council. They're in the commissioner's court and they're doing everything they can to fight for democracy. And, and this just gives us an opportunity to give them a platform. And of course, that's what we've done at The Signal. That's what we continue to do. And I encourage folks to go to texassignal.com and read your full Q&A with Beto um, and to continue to, you know, follow and support the progressive journalism that we do it's a texas signal so whether it's you like to listen to podcasts or you like to read some of the headlines and some of the stories 
Um, it's a great opportunity to learn about some of the other heroes that are doing really great work in the progressive movement around the state. And so that's that's one of the greatest things about this platform is that we 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 have that. So yeah, and and, and obviously as you've talked about, the news is just just going to keep coming. Um, it, it's it was very awe inspiring yesterday when uh, I, I I can't recall which speaker was saying this, but the fact that you know not sliding whatsoever those other states, but these fights happened in Georgia and Florida. Those bills went through and in Texas. It's still going, and so. We are at the forefront of this. Our state mm -hmm. is at the forefront of this, and the signal is going to be at the forefront of, of covering this from a day to day, as well as going into deeper kind of analytical aspects of what this means for our state and for Texans. Yeah, and to that, if you go to texassignal.com, you'll see at the top right that you can become a Patreon supporter, and basically that means that you contribute a, a certain amount, usually a small amount. It all adds up, but it allows us to continue to do this, and so we really appreciate that, and we'll continue to keep you informed on what's happening in the great state of Texas and even more so what you can do to get involved and make the changes that we want to see. And so, grab some swag from the website. Yeah. The shirts are, the shirts are very soft. I can yeah. attest to that. They're extra soft. Uh, love it. Um, yeah. Get you a bumper sticker, slap it on that car um, or your bike helmet. Um, but yeah. Uh, so thanks again for everybody for uh, joining us, you know, follow us on Twitter at Texas signal. We're on Instagram. We're on TikTok. We're all over the web, anywhere you listen to your podcast, you can find us. So until the next great adventure, uh, we will talk to you soon. <laughs> Later. Thanks, y'all. Yeah.